super, super excited for this one. This is one that we've been looking forward to for a long time, Pomp. Welcome back to New York City, my man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is this is exciting. Every time you come by Coinage, it's exciting because, you know, there aren't a lot of people who can talk about all of crypto holistically and how it fits into everything culturally, financially, whatever the hell's going on. And today, you know, we've got about 45 minutes to go through all the big topics in crypto, what you're up to, what you're excited about. And so, you know, first off, just super thankful that you're taking the time to chat with us, man. Absolutely. No, I'm excited about what you guys are doing and uh, let's uh, talk about whatever you want. Yeah, well, I wanted to start with all the all the big stuff that happened yesterday because so many people are waiting literally every day, checking their phones to see when the Bitcoin spot ETF is going to be coming. And yesterday was a bit of, you know, a lot of nonsense going on with Cointelegraph reporting fake news. And and yet I think there's a lot of things to actually talk about when it comes to this being real. And that Larry Fink, BlackRock CEO, is talking about how much this is, you know, a, a chance to celebrate, I think, how far crypto's come. He called it a flight to quality, the pump that we saw, uh, which before, like just a few years ago, he was saying that it was money laundering is all crypto was. So what do you take away from the actual events yesterday and kind of where we're at with the excitement around this Bitcoin ETF? Yeah, so if you just put aside for a second Bitcoin and kind of the crypto markets, um, it's very obvious that information travels faster these days. Um, there's also been a degradation of trust in large institutions. And so it becomes much easier for people to, uh, one, get information, share information, um, but also they are more open to who they trust and, and where that information comes from. And so you have a bunch of forces that kind of lead to somebody who has a media company can say something and if they have any degree of uh, audience it is likely or at least potentially uh, likely that, that that can happen so um yeah that, i think that's more of a sign of the times than it is bitcoin or, or anything else obviously we see with public stocks this happens we see with um literally you know uh, geopolitical conflict we see it with um there's been announcements of like celebrity deaths that they're actually not dead and all kinds of situations when you look at Bitcoin specifically, I, I, I do agree with Larry Fink that yesterday when it was announced that there was an ETF approved and Bitcoin shot up a couple thousand dollars in a matter of minutes, that just shows how much pent up demand there is for the Bitcoin ETF. That doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily signal pent up demand for Bitcoin. It's the Bitcoin ETF. And, and I think those two things are, are really important to kind of separate out and, and we can talk about why. Um, and then the other piece is the market kind of worked how you would expect, right? An announcement went out price went up. When it was said that the announcement was fake, the price went back down. And so um, what that tells me is like the market is becoming more and more uh, kind of liquid and, and uh, somewhat efficient uh, in the sense that people are responding both to the positives and the negatives. Um, in the bull market, there would be news that would come out that could be potentially negative and the price didn't care. Like it just kept going up. And yeah. so I think what you're seeing now is uh, what I would consider much more rational um, and realistic, which, which actually signals a healthier market and something that you'd be excited about over the long term. Yeah, the rationality in crypto is always exciting to see. And I think it's, again, a testament to how far markets have evolved. And I think, you know, a lot of people were maybe making too much of the idea of manipulation and obviously the SEC's restraint and maybe hesitation in approving a Bitcoin spot ETF has always been about the ability for the market to be manipulated or, or kind of protecting consumers and putting this tool on the market. You said that it might not be, you know, a great thing in terms of a Bitcoin ETF being different than actual Bitcoin. I am curious kind of what you think the impact will be in the likelihood of getting there, though, because you got Bloomberg analysts out there actually saying it's more likely than not by, I think, the end of the year, mm -hmm. uh, if not into January, about like a 75%, 80% chance kind of hovering in that zone. I mean, what do you make of just how far we've come? Like when you actually step back and think about, I've known you for years and the idea of Larry Fink, one of yeah. the largest asset managers out there, kind of evolving from this is just money laundering to, all right, yeah, we're on the verge of seeing a Bitcoin ETF come out. Larry Fink is the chief marketing officer of Bitcoin right now, um, and that is great for Bitcoin adoption. And it's because Larry Fink has a very specific reputation, uh, a following. Um, he's seen as a serious person. He's seen as someone who uh, has a pulse on in the institutional world. Um, and there is an element of like, if 
the CEO of BlackRock decrees something, uh, it can then set into motion what the market does. Um, there are very few people in the world who can do that. Uh, Larry is obviously one of them. And if you really look uh, through the evolution of Bitcoin, uh, I think of it almost like a baton race, mm -hmm. where uh, there was people who picked up the baton very early on, obviously Satoshi being the first person, eventually disappears and hands the baton to someone else. Then you get another cohort of people, and you get another cohort of people. And, and if you really look at it over the last couple of years, the baton has passed a, a few times now, right? Um, and so Larry Fink being the next one, there's really only one other group of people left, which are the governments or the sovereign wealth funds. And so um, it, it's pretty incredible to see. Uh, but I do think that uh, there's also an irony to Bitcoin success, which is that the more successful Bitcoin becomes in terms of institutional adoption, it loses some of the value proposition of being outside of the system, not co-opted, uh, um, kind of this fully decentralized thing, mm -hmm. right? You can have a decentralized system in terms of uh, the way that it is created, the way that it is governed, but if you then have centralized ownership, right? Again, it is not de it is not centralized in terms of its structure, it's not centralized in terms of governance, but you do have centralization of ownership. And so what that does is it actually erodes away the ability for anyone to be able to participate and, and actually get wealth out into the hands of kind of the everyday person. Yep. Now, the counter argument to that, which I think is important, is that if you look at the data, actually Bitcoin has been being dispersed you know, kind of more decentralized. So uh, the quote unquote whales, people who had a lot of Bitcoin, they have been selling over the years. And so uh, you do get, you know, kind of wallet addresses with at least one Bitcoin going up, hitting all time highs, things like that. Um, so I, I think it's less about like, I'm worried, oh, if all of a sudden Wall Street comes in, they're gonna centralize the ownership because the data is suggesting we're going the other way. Yeah. Um, but I do think that it is important to kind of continue to pay attention and realize, you know, the holder base is changing. Right, and so when you have public companies buying Bitcoin, like they are not the same as individuals who have a very specific view of the world. When you have regulated Wall Street organizations starting to come in and, and want to get these Bitcoin ETFs approved, it is a different holder base. It's not necessarily bad, but I do think that it's worth paying attention to. Yeah, and I also feel like you know we saw a lot of that with the coverage. Just kind of you mentioned nation states in El Salvador and kind of what's been going on there, and the coverage of you know the early impetus of putting this into practice and trying to get people on it. It was not very friendly. I think a lot of mainstream outlets liked shitting, for better lack or for, for lack of a better term, on Bitcoin and the community and the progress and attempts to try and do that there. But you've seen a lot of push with kind of the Lightning Network and the idea of that on top of this uh, push and kind of inserting it into people's everyday lives for, you know, whether it's actually buying things or just using it as a store of value. And you talk about passing the baton. I mean, like, I wonder how you feel about all this stuff, too. You personally, like, because, I mean, you held the baton, I think it's fair to say, for a long time in advancing the space and getting people involved. I mean, how do you look at it personally when you step back and think about how far the space has come? Maybe that baton landing in Larry Fink's hands. I mean, that was always the goal, was more institutional demand, at least if you're in the camp of how do we see the market cap grow? But you're right, it comes at kind of, I guess, maybe a little bit of a, of a cost. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like, what are you optimizing for, right? And then, um, Bitcoin is unique in that uh, Bitcoin can be something different to different people. And so s for some people, Bitcoin is a censorship resistant asset because that's really, really important to them. Mm -hmm. uh, for other people, it is the ability to protect their purchasing power. Uh, for other people, it's a speculative tool, right? I mean, and th there's all these different uh, kind of value propositions. And so if you want institutional demand, if you want the price to go up, Larry Fink is like your guy, right? Yeah. Like that, that is a very, very <laughs> good person to have on your side and someone who is going to open up adoption uh, via an ETF structure and, and, and all of that. Um, but if you're the person who's actually saying like, no, we wanna separate money from state and we want to uh, have uh, the ability to continue to kind of erode away the power of those who control the currency, et cetera, um, actually Larry Fink is not your guy, right? <laughs> actually Larry Fink is, you know, in some Probably ways, enemy number one. Yeah, he, he, he represents everything that you are against and, and so, um, it's very similar to like the political uh, arena, right? If you look at politics, uh, there's some people who are on the right, there's some people who are on the left, there's some people who are on the center, and then you have some people who are on the extreme right and on the extreme left. Yeah. And regardless of what you, you know, your political leanings are or what you think is right or wrong, like if you look at it from a, a systems perspective, um, there's a lot of tension there. Right, and so uh, the U.S. government being, you know, one example of this like democratic process is like, man, it is a bumpy ride. People are yelling and screaming at each other. They disagree. That there's all this emotion and, and you know, kind of chaos and uncertainty and whatever. 
But like, we probably got one of the better systems, if not the best system in the world, right? Yeah. In terms of all of that chaos and tension and, and uncertainty and, and arguing and bickering, all stuff, gets us to this point where like, hopefully we are better off than if we were just in a system where only like one person dominated. Mm -hmm. And so same thing now is coming with Bitcoin where uh, there's actually a lot of disagreement. Right? I mean, you can see this with uh, things like new technologies in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, Taro or um, ordinals or, or whatever, uh, all the way down to like, is an ETF good or bad, right? Yeah. And so the different perspectives create this tension. That tension hopefully will end up pushing Bitcoin and, and kind of the world into a place where it's better off than if we didn't have that tension. But again, it's like bumpy, right? And and, um, and I think that that is actually a sign that we're going through the the growing pains and doing the things that are necessary to get there. Yeah. In terms of the baton, um, you know, I don't think anyone's confused about my thoughts on Bitcoin, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, it is also something where uh, I don't think we want the same person year in and year out uh, to be the biggest voice. Right. And, and I actually don't even think that I had the biggest voice. I think for a certain subset of an audience, definitely there was people who uh, were paying attention. Um, but what you actually want is you want to constantly be growing that base. And so what ends up happening is if you go all the way back to the beginning of Bitcoin, there's like two or three people, right. After yep. Satoshi who like, they basically did the work. Right. And you know, for those who weren't around, there's like, when's this Casares? There's Roger Ver, right? There's Trace Meyer. Like you can go through a list of maybe, you know, maybe we can come up with 10 people. Without those people, I don't know if Bitcoin goes from Satoshi to, okay, we've got some adoption, yeah. right? And, and so how many of those people are still around in public and talking about this stuff? And, and it's kind of like almost part of Bitcoin is knowing, hey, I, make your contribution and then like get out of the way so the next person can make the contribution, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, well, I think that, I mean, I think that's kind of, I mean, to your point on democracy and the bumpy road and how it evolves, I think that's kind of a key element too, is like term limits exist, I think for the same reason, you don't really have a king. And to your point on decentralization around Bitcoin as people, you know, step in, do their thing, say what they believe. And you're right, there are battles, we've covered them, whether it's Taproot Wizards and Udi and what they're doing with Ordinals and people who don't like that. And then you also have, you know, the Eric Voorhees types who are very kind of set in their libertarian thinking of there's one way and each way that we try and like give in to the idea of regulation and co-opting to the old financial system, we're losing a little bit of that. And I think it's been fascinating, honestly, like to cover what people in the industry and in these worlds actually think and which parts win um, has you been have to pretty wild. There's, a lot, there's also a lot of uh, intellectual dishonesty when uh, money is involved, right? Yeah. If you think about, uh, kind of take your average Bitcoin holder who uh, is on Twitter talking, um, your reputation is tied to it, right? Because you think it's going up or down in price. Um, your financial health is tied to it because you think either it's going long or short, whatever. Um, and so what ends up happening is uh, human nature takes over and you begin to look for information that reaffirms your view. Now, what is always interesting to me is, uh, are you able to evaluate the market as objectively as possible and still make decisions and know why you're making the decision? I'll give you a great example. If you were to go back to 2020 and you were to look at all of the assets and you said, I'm gonna buy Bitcoin mm -hmm. at the beginning of 2020 before the pandemic hit, you outperformed every single hedge fund to today, right? Great. What a lot of Bitcoiners won't say is actually if you go back to the beginning of 2020 and you bought Ethereum or Ether instead of Bitcoin, you would have outperformed, obviously, if buying Ether versus Bitcoin. Now, if you are the person who is looking solely for economic gain and just wanted to quote unquote get rich, then you should have bought Ether instead of Bitcoin, right? It's an objective fact, it's just math, what are the percentages? I actually think one of the unique parts of Bitcoin is there's a lot of people who say, I don't necessarily only care about the price going up. Anyone who says I care 0%, well, why do you get excited when the price goes up, right? <laughs> so, so it's like human nature again, get tied into it. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who realize, yes, in certain points in the market, especially in bull markets, you could buy other assets that go up more in price, but they have a fundamental belief in either Bitcoin's impact on the world, you know, censorship resistance, the ability to protect uh, um, uh, purchasing power, like all these different components. And so in some regards, they are being a non-economic actor. And it's very rare in financial markets that you get non-economic actors that are making capital allocation decisions, yep. right? Historically, that's actually ended up really poorly because people do dumb things and the market doesn't end up working. 
again, Bitcoin's uniqueness is that you have a portion of people who are 100% capitalist, you know, economic actors, and they just want to uh, get a, a great financial return. And so Bitcoin ends up being something that they're allocating to. Sure. On the other side, you also have a lot of people who I would put in the non-economic category where they say, I don't care if Bitcoin goes to $1 or to a million dollars. I believe in what Bitcoin stands for and what the promise of Bitcoin is. And so I'm going to participate and I'm going to do everything I can to make it successful. There's not many assets. Like people aren't going around buying houses being like, I'm going to buy this house because you know what? I think that a house should be here. Well, I think that's been interesting too in, in terms of like the idea of what happened with GameStop and AMC. And, you know, it's kind of funny to see right now the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry, kind of being inserted now into the discussions in Congress about what should you, what should the U.S. do about crypto? And I do see that overlap. I mean, like you think about what happened there was a bunch of Davids teamed up against uh, a big Goliath in Wall Street to try and say, look, we have some power here. We can influence the markets if we team up together. And that's kind of what we saw with GameStop and AMC was just kind of something that normally seems impossible. But with the power of the Internet, the power of kind of decentralization, everyone kind of working together, it was wild to watch. And I was there, you know, I was covering it. I've worked at CNBC and Yahoo, and it was kind of a turning point, I think, for markets. And you talk about kind of Bitcoin and this idea of not being true economic actors. And I think that that's kind of an interesting thing too. Like GameStop and AMC might not have been the best places to put your money. Um, but you had someone publishing research and said, maybe it is. And a lot of people believed it. Um, and so I think that that's kind of a powerful piece and also kind of where culture is headed. Like people are investing in things. You got Robinhood popping up, people putting their money behind companies that might not be the best investments, but they want to see them continue to thrive. I don't think it's new, right? I mean, how many people uh, were told buy American, mm -hmm. you know, buy American bonds. That's the patriotic thing to do in a time of war, right? Like, like these things have been happening. Um, now, historically, the, at least the examples that were told, people bought the thing and it worked. Yeah. And so only we talk about those situations. There's plenty where it didn't work. Um, but, but the other piece is uh, as new people come in, there is a new way to look at an asset, right? And so, you know, if you just accelerate to kind of our current situation, um, Janet Yellen recently gave an interview. She said that we can afford, you know, to fund uh, two wars, uh, speaking of Ukraine and, and in Israel. Um, we have a national debt that has exploded by more than $500 billion in a single month. Um, our national debt interest payments now are larger than our defense budget uh, payments. And when you look at all of this, you're like, yeah, w we can afford it if you're willing to print tons and tons and tons of money. Yeah. Now, one of the downsides to uh, doing that, obviously, is you're basically taking from the future to fund uh, the, the current situation. And so go back to Larry Fink's comments, like that's basically what he's talking about, right? What is are the quality assets? Well, they're assets that can't be debased. And they're assets that are global. And they're assets that people are going to hold for really long periods of time. There's not very many assets that fit in that bucket, yeah. right? And so whenever you see Larry Fink, Paul Tudor Jones, Stanley Druckenmiller, you know, uh, uh, Peter Thiel, like all, you just go through the line, like all these great investors, they all are coming to the same conclusion. Yeah. And so you got to ask yourself, like, are the best investors in the world all off sides together? It's happened before, for sure. Yeah. But it's probably more likely that they know something and eventually, no matter how much you rail against it, and once you do the work, you'll come to the same conclusion. Well, yeah, I feel like it gets lost in the sauce when you think about, you know, covering everything on a daily basis, you might lose the big picture, right? If you're just looking at little tiny moves, you might forget the fact that, wait a minute, like it was, it was you know, $300 not too long ago. Uh, when I graduated college, it was like, okay, you can legitimately get a Bitcoin for 300 bucks. And now here we are in 2023, and it's almost 30 grand, depending on what Cointelegraph is saying about the news of the day. But I would say that it is kind of, you know, when you step back and look at it, and this will be the last question on price, and we'll put our, you know, financial actors hat on because, you know, it's not a bad thing to make money. But when you think about what it does, right, to the price of Bitcoin, a lot of people have talked about it. And you know, Mike Novogratz, a bunch of people have always said this was kind of the holy grail, the idea of people who could not touch Bitcoin or crypto before having an entry point into it and what that does to bringing money into it and what that does to price. So, I mean, when you put those things together, what do you see as, you know, 2024 is not too long away. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the Bitcoin ETF getting approved then, how do you see it changing things? So let's go back to 2020. Um, 
leading into 2020, so in 2019, um, I wrote multiple pieces and I basically said, uh, Bitcoin is about to get rocket fuel. Right, I used rocket fuel as a term uh, that a lot of people didn't like, but I, I felt like it would describe the situation that was happening. And the situation that I saw was we had inv inverted yield curves. We had a high number of CEOs leaving their jobs. We had multiple metrics within the economy that were showing that we were likely headed into the end of an economic cycle and the bull market was gonna be over. Um, in those scenarios, historically, we have printed money, we've cut interest rates. Now. I didn't know a global pandemic was coming, but in February, we accelerated what was already a trend of all of these things leading to some sort of market crash with the pandemic. And we basically said, shut it all down. What they did in response was they printed money and they went ahead and uh, cut um, uh, interest rates. Now, the reason why I called it rocket fuel was because that was going to drive demand. You were putting liquidity into the market, asset prices should rise. At the same time, you were gonna get the halving. And so you were gonna have a demand shock and a supply shock at the same time. Basically, if, if you understand supply and demand economics, you have to get price to move upwards in order to be able to find a market equilibrium. Now, take that same framework and look at where we are today. Mm -hmm. We have a demand shock that is coming in the halving next year. Uh, we have very, very high interest rates, which means they have a margin of error in which they can cut significantly um, and still not go below zero. Uh, we are likely headed into a recession because now we are starting to see inverted yield curves, people quitting their jobs. You know, I saw an article today, uh, um, David Solomon at Goldman is no longer going to DJ uh, <laughs> big high profile events. And so somebody tweeted and said, well, the, the high interest rates killed at least one job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then you have this ETF. And so actually this rocket fuel may be even bigger than the last one because what you're going to get is you're going to get a demand shock of ETF, you're going to get a demand shock of having, and then you're going to get supply side shock in terms of them having to ease monetary policy. Now, ease monetary policy could be a response just to a recession. Also, then you got the national debt problem, you got funding of two wars, and then on top of that, you're going into an election season where yeah. all of a sudden money becomes a chip in terms of uh, people trying to get elections and, and things like that. Both sides of the aisle do that. And so, you look at it and you're like, man, we're about to just run this right back, right? And, and so when, when you see these frameworks, it's not about this is for sure gonna happen or this is not gonna happen. I just look at it probabilistically, we will have the demand shocks. Yep. Probabilistically, we're gonna have the supply shocks. The price is going to have to move to accommodate everyone. How much it moves, I think there's a lot of debate. Some people think it'll move 100%, some people think it's 20%, some people think it's you know 2000%. Um, it kind of almost doesn't matter because when you have these setups, um, the price is going to move more than almost any other asset because the other assets are highly liquid, already globally adopted, been around for decades, and they don't have these, you know, kind of two um, uh, um, kind of contributing factors. They yep. usually only have an increase in the supply side demand, uh, or I'm sorry, in demand. They don't have the supply side stuff. And so that ends up being pretty interesting. Yeah, admittedly, I've gone back and forth on kind of like the way of thinking about Bitcoin. I think a lot of people have, whether it's a risk on, risk off asset, the idea of it just kind of trading as, you know, a high beta tech stock, but also, you know, the idea of now being caught in this wave of things. And to your point, I think it is a combination of bullishness around the ETF and the having in coming next year. Like, what does that do to things? And I think I've landed on, and maybe this is kind of you know, over a few years is just the idea of Bitcoin and crypto kind of being animal spirits in the economy. It's just kind of, all right, it's the narrative and the narrative definitely matters. I mean, that's uh, rational actors. I think you're, you, you encapsulated it well. Everyone's supposedly running around just trying to profit. And that's the way that economists look at things. And I think with crypto, because it's so misunderstood, a lot of people just lean on their idea of is the number going to go up or not? Yeah. And a lot of it's just the narrative. And that's what animal spirits, any, basically anything economists can't fit into their models, they just call it animal spirits. And I think there is a piece of that that's true with crypto. And when you have the narrative and the idea of the ETF coming through, I think a lot of people might attach themselves to the idea of, wait, we're onto something here. I think that mainstream economics and financial markets have a lot of things wrong, um, like fundamentally wrong, and it's why people are so bad at investing. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we literally gave an award to someone to come up with the efficient market hypothesis, which is objectively not true. 
Um, and so, first of all, we should take all the Nobel Prize uh, awards and we should just throw them in the trash. <laughs> because if you give awards to people, you figure out that it's not true and you don't take the award away. Yeah. Kind of, you know, it defeats the purpose of giving the award um, because the person then runs around and tells everyone, hey, I won the award for this thing that wasn't true. <laughs> um, and, and so, like, just take a fish and market hypothesis, like that is not true. Another one though is risk on risk off assets. If you were to ask someone, um, hey, in 2021, were we risk on or risk off? The average person will tell you we were risk on. The best investors in the world would tell you that it was risk off. And the reason is because they were selling into a bull market because they knew that it was overvalued. You should be taking risk off the table in the bull market. Yeah. And so when the price drops down, the mainstream economists and financial markets talk about, oh, it's risk off. No, the best investors in the world are going risk on because they understand that allocating at lower prices is actually better. And so if you take a number of these fundamental beliefs in financial markets and you just do the opposite, you will end up much better. Yeah. And so Bitcoin is the epitome of this, where it basically takes all of these things that people believe in the traditional financial markets and it codified a different thing centralization, right? Uh, monetary policy being uh, programmatic, like all these things. And it's the best performing asset. And so what we end up having is we end up having um, a much more arrogant, concentrated belief in the things that we were told were true. And we have a dearth of independent thought and critical thought um, that allows you to see maybe actually those things are wrong and yep. by doing the opposite that's where the returns lie putting those things together uh maybe this is a fair question to ask and i don't remember if i asked you this at bitcoin miami but we're not surrounded by a bunch of hardo bitcoiners so i'll ask you this now when's the last time you sold bitcoin the only time i've ever sold bitcoin in the last i don't know four or five years uh whatever it's been uh pay taxes yeah um and uh i just continue to buy. And, you know, sometimes uh, I'm like really disciplined and I'm like, hey, I should be buying, you know, every two weeks. Sometimes it's, uh, hey, I'm going to wait and uh, we're selling an asset or, you know, uh, getting some sort of payment from something or whatever. I'll make a big purchase. Yeah. Um, but it, it's pretty clear that Bitcoin, if you really fundamentally understand it, you should never sell it. Right. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is like, for someone who's my age with my risk profile, right? Who's got kind of uh, um, the understanding that I have, like all these, like, it's like very clear, like I personally should not sell Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, there are other things that could be shed in a portfolio if need be in other parts of the, for what depending I'm trying on to what you got. Yeah. Right now, if I was 65 years old, 75 years old, right? Um, I needed my investment portfolio to fund my lifestyle. I'm not going to take it to my grave. Like all these different things. I didn't care about, you know, passing it down to people, whatever. Like actually you want to be culling your profile or your uh, portfolio to be able to generate cash, to be able to live and do all stuff. So it's like all about like, who are we talking about? There's no one size fits all. Yep. Um, and, and so what becomes interesting interesting about, you know, people selling, not selling, whatever, is like, if Bitcoin ends up working and you buy Bitcoin and then you never sell it throughout your entire life and 100% of your wealth is in there, you are actually poor, right? There are horror stories of take tech founders who are equity rich and cash poor. Yep. They can't sell the equity. So if you treat Bitcoin at forever as an illiquid stock, and you never sell it, what is the point of the wealth, Yeah. right? And so I think that um, what we will likely see over the next coming decades is young people today who are very into Bitcoin will begin to see that go up in value and they will have a choice to make. Am I just gonna hold this until I die and like it was just a liquid the whole time? There's a good portion of people in the Bitcoin community I think will do that. Yeah. There's also gonna be a portion of people who say, hey, once I hit some age or I hit you know some value of the Bitcoin, I actually want to enjoy it, right? Now, what's interesting is this is not a Bitcoin specific challenge. This is a challenge that's been in financial markets forever. And so um, I think that you need to be a little bit higher risk tolerance to have allocated to Bitcoin you know, pre 2020. Um, but those people are now getting older, right? You know, When I started uh, kind of playing around and, and looking at Bitcoin stuff, I was in my 20s. Now I'm in my thirties and like, you know, I got a kid, like, like you start <laughs> thinking differently, right? Yeah. Um, and, and some of it's for the better and some of it's, you know, not. Um, and, and so I think it's just like 
understanding that this is a financial asset sure. and it is not a religion. It is not, you know, something where like you get points because uh, you held your Bitcoin for the longest. Like that does not mean, you know, anything other than like what is right for you and in, in your uh, personal um, situation and, and like that's okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, everyone in the space has evolved too. It's not just you and I that are aging and moving into different life stages. It's everybody who, who has also been paying attention to this space over the years. And so, you know, we've got about 20 minutes left and I think there's a lot of different topics to get into. Uh, you mentioned awards. We've got one over there on the mantle as a Web3 media company. So I want to get your thoughts on use cases for crypto beyond just financial investments as we move forward in this iteration of crypto. But also, you know, looking back on kind of what's happened, um, you know, we won that award for our story about Doquan and Terra. And obviously right now in New York, the SBF trial is ongoing. I'm curious to kind of get your take. First off, have you been paying attention to the trial at all? You've been uh, watching it? I see some tweets here and there, but look, we, we, have a, uh, uh, we have a legal system that usually gets it right. Not yeah. always, but usually gets it right. Um, and I don't find it productive to pontificate about the outcomes of situations where other people have such an information advantage, right? Yeah. And so if you look at the prosecutors, the defense, the judge, the jury, like all those who have way more information, they, they're much more knowledgeable about all the intricacies, et cetera. Um, I think that it is uh, worth paying attention to the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but I try to focus on the things that, you know, are within our control on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I see, you know, some of the tweets and obviously things that are ridiculous that everyone's freaking out about, uh, you know, uh, tend to be ridiculous and things that are funny or things that are serious, whatever. Yep. Um, but but uh, I'm not somebody who, you know, if you put a TV in front of me and say, hey, we're gonna watch, you know, Judge Judy, <laughs> eh, whatever, I don't really care, right? It's the same thing kind of here is just, um, yeah. just focus on things you can control and, and that's t technically my strategy. Yeah, I've kind, of, I've kind of looked at it the same way. I guess, you know, more broadly speaking, when you think about all the things that led to crypto going down in 2022 and so many people looking forward to just kind of turning the chapter after this trial wraps up and whatever ruling is, is reached, it's just kind of like the impact on everybody else, right? And I think that that's kind of interesting to think about in terms of price and what happened in the bull run, leverage, and where we go from here. Um, and so I'm kind of interested to get your take on, on kind of what the future looks like because everyone's hope is that a lot of the bad stuff is flushed out. And Zach Prince, the CEO of BlockFi, was on the stand too. And I thought, you know, I was looking at all the crossfire that happened in 2022, and he painted a very interesting picture in terms of, look, what are we as a company supposed to do? We look at balance sheets, we look at lending, and we make the best choices we can. And that was kind of, I think, the whole industry in 2022 was trying to figure some of this stuff out. And if people are lying about things, they're lying about things. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how you protect against that as an industry because you can't stop people from lying unless you completely audit, I guess, everything. And even when people talk about on-chain audits, there are ways to kind of get around that too. So I don't know. I mean, like so much trust was lost and we've talked about this before, but I do wonder if there's any overhang, you know, as you think about the next bull run in crypto and if anyone think learned anything. I don't think it's specific to this industry, right? Um, you know, look at the banking crisis that we uh, went through last year. Essentially, there was a legal way for banks to uh, tell a story about their balance sheets that may not have been reflective of what was actually true in the moment. And You're talking about so, like writing down losses on bonds. So yeah, on bonds, like if you don't have to value. market to market, right? Uh, it's not a problem unless everyone shows up and says, give me my money, <laughs> which we saw a couple of different times happen, sure. right? And, and so um, it becomes this very interesting thing of, you know, what is the thing that everyone agrees on? Like, what are the rules? Um, and so in the traditional banking world, that is a rule that has been agreed upon through regulation and, and kind of uh, legislation that they don't have to do that. Okay. Um, Thankfully for that sector, uh, the government is willing to step in and bail out all of the depositors. Now, I didn't hear anyone in kind of the Bitcoin and crypto world begging the government to step in and bail out any of these companies, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if we were sitting here talking about three of the four largest bank failures in history happened, and also a bunch of crypto companies went out of business, and people across the spectrum lost their money, well, we would just lump it into like the financial industry. But actually what ended up happening for different reasons, right? Not, not necessarily the same reasons, is we had 
banks and we had uh, these crypto companies and they were treated very differently. Now, again, I actually think that the free market and, and kind of not having people step in is a better situation um, in the long run. But obviously in the short run, it is better for people if the government does step in. And so there's always this trade off between long and, and short term uh, impact. Now, what I think to your point about the intentional misleading, the intentional of breaking rules, all that kind of stuff, like, yeah, there, there is an element of like how much diligence, et cetera, can someone do? Not even should they do, but can they do? And so, for example, um, we have auditors, right? Uh, if the auditors are tricked and they're trying to do their job and, and, and they certify something, the expectation of, you know, a company, let's say, is doing business with uh, kind of a bad actor, if they get an audited financial statement, I don't think there's anyone in the world who's like, well, we're going to go, you know, even further, we're going to audit it ourselves or something, right? Yeah. And, and so, um, what becomes kind of a weird situation is like, well, what is the answer? And I don't think anyone has a good answer, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so at some degree in the traditional financial world, you have to rely on a degree of trust somewhere. Yeah. Um, the promise of Bitcoin and, and kind of cryptocurrency as an industry, et cetera, is that you won't have to have that trust. Um, I think that it is definitely closer to that than the traditional financial world. But I think what we're seeing is whenever there is centralization, there has to be some degree of trust. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think that that's an industry specific thing. I think that's just across the entire world. Agreed. And I, I just think that that's kind of always the, you know, the interesting kind of hypocrisy, I guess, technically in like a space that's always been about trust no one or, you know, you don't need to trust anybody. That's the reason why we have decentralized systems or everything like that. And it's, it has been interesting to kind of see the industry itself grapple with how much do we want to centralize how much do we want to make, you know, a little bit easier? And we're seeing it kind of happen with NFTs now, too. It's quite interesting now as, you know, I quit um, my traditional finance anchor job at Yahoo to, to really dive into this space and start to see, you know, it's similar because you had Celsius, you had BlockFi, you had a lot of these institutions that made it easy for people to start to earn interest and, you know, the custody differences there between not your keys, not your coin situation. And now kind of happening with NFTs. And I don't know how closely you watch that, but like the onboarding process with like friend tech or everything else, like using privy kind of these uh, abilities to kind of custody NFTs and make the onboarding process way easier. I feel like the industry has always grappled with this idea of how hard do we want to make it? How much homework is everyone going to have to do to get into this space? And there's always a trade off, I think, b between like security, adoption, and how we grow the space. So I, I think it's interesting and, and we can kind of shift to- well, One thing I would say on that is um, I have a very simple framework as to whether I think something will work or not. Yeah. And, I, and I always ask someone, are you building for nerds or are you building for moms? Right? And, and like, it, it's so- <laughs> Or nerdy moms is the case maybe. Yeah, well, it, well, it's just, if, if you think about, are you building for nerds or are you building for moms, right? The nerds are going to go through immense pain and friction to be able to use something because they enjoy it, right? They're intellectually stimulated by it. They wanna know, hey, what what is the underlying technologies? How does it work, right? What what are What is your product roadmap, all this stuff? Or do they wanna be first? So well, they can all, make all money. This. I think it's, and I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. Of I just course, think it's they, interesting. All, all this stuff, right? But if you think about it, like, are you building for the proverbial mom, right? Like. What does it do? Yep. And Facebook is like, talk to your friends. Like, <laughs> cool, right? Like, there's no, like, what is the technology? How does it work? I'm not going to go through a bunch of friction. Like, actually, the fact that I put in an email and a password, it's like pretty high friction, right, yeah. for, for that group. And yeah. so I, I do think a lot about um, this is a natural evolution of technology. If you go back to the early 1990s, right, again, there was a lot of people building stuff that was cool, mm -hmm. but it wasn't ready for the mainstream. Um, and, and so one of the questions investors have to ask over the coming years is, how much of this technology will evolve to the point where it meets consumer trends and consumers are ready to yeah. use this stuff versus it's gonna end up being really cool technology, but it doesn't actually get commercialized. Yes. Um, and, and I don't think there's a clear answer yet. Well, I think that's a real interesting point too, though, because you think about who's left on Facebook, it's mostly moms. And so I guess, you know, who you're building for changes over time if you don't want to iterate or change anything. And, you know, to get your take, because you and I have talked to each other, I think maybe even since I was at CNBC, like the idea of what the next thing that excites you. And I, it's been interesting to watch your career path because like, you know, we initially met because we were only talking about crypto. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about other things now. And, you know, I'm curious, cause you mentioned ETH and I've always kind of talked to you about like, is it all Bitcoin or are you also like Ethereum? And like, I don't know what excites you now because I quit my job to your point. I think there's a lot of use case now in the space. Like everyone knows there's something there with NFTs. 
does any technology ever get it right when it's first introduced? No, that's not, uh, even the internet didn't work that way. You had to have pets.com to get Amazon and it took Amazon, what, 12 years, more than a decade mm -hmm. to finally hit its stride. So with what we're doing, I think it's kind of interesting to think about the creator economy and the idea of fans kind of building with creators. And that's kind of what Coinage came from. You talk about trust. Like I've grappled with this a lot now. Like can people in crypto actually trust themselves? You saw the Cointelegraph mishap with news. You heard their editor in chief talking about, well, we gotta be first or we're gonna be last. And who are you serving really? in that model. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I'm excited and I quit because I see a use case to where you can pair the technology with what the mission is in a way that you put it on chain and you can introduce, you know, a model that works for everybody. And so, you know, there's Substack, there's YouTube, there's Patreon, there's whatever. But what we're enabling is the first time that an audience member can influence the content at Coinage and own the brand itself. Mm -hmm. We're a registered DAO cooperative. The idea of literally our NFTs up 150% in a year where almost all NFTs are down. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is because we're attaching it to real ownership, real utility, and the real influence to literally build something with a creator. And I think that's cool. And I think that's a way that existing technology has gotten us to this point. You have followers, but they don't own anything that you're doing, right? They're just consuming the content you put out. But you can become the biggest brand ambassador for them and actually co-own the thing that they're working on with them. So, I mean, incentives drive the world, right? And so if somebody can figure out a way to use incentives to in get behavior that will help them, people will try it, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, Think of what Mr. Beast does. Mr. Beast essentially gives money to one person in a video and a bunch of other people watch aspiring to be the one person who got the money, right? <laughs> like, like if you really break it down to like one of the most basic things, he's got a couple of different videos, but like that is a really, really good um, uh, thing on the internet yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, building an audience and, and getting viral. And he's the best in the world, like the single best person in the world at making YouTube videos. Now, if you were to ask him, my guess is he would love to give money to his whole audience every day, right? Like there'd be this amazing thing. And like, if he could figure out how to do views and like all this stuff, whatever, he can't. And so is that a technology problem? Is that a coordination problem? Is that, you know, just a um, uh, audience, you know, consumer trend problem? Like, like there's a bunch of theories, yeah. um, but I think whoever figures that out, then uh, I do think will, um, you know, be able to build a big business. It's just, how do you do it? Yeah, I think, well, I think that's the exciting piece of this whole thing is that Bitcoin proved when you align interests, you can do some pretty amazing things. And the whole industry ever since that moment has been trying to emulate it across all different things. And I just think that right now, what NFTs are doing, and to your point on ordinals, you know, it's also now possible to say, well, Bitcoin's doing that too. And so the idea of just putting these incentives on chain is just a really good way to have, you know, again, all value tracked. Like you can legitimately, a piece of content can trade now. Mm -hmm. Like tokenization of everything seems to be kind of where this whole space is headed. And, you know, it can touch a lot of different industries once you do that. So I don't know that's what I'm excited about, but the question to you is what you're excited about. And I don't mean to put my own words into your own head, but what is Pomp excited about? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a number of problems in the American economy uh, in our society that are very big, um, they're very painful, uh, they're gonna be very hard to solve, um, and we need people to go solve them. And so uh, I've been spending a lot of time uh, looking at these problems and trying to understand what are the potential solutions, uh, who are the people that are needed, uh, what are the capital requirements, and how could we actually go solve those problems. Um, some of that stuff obviously can be addressed by Bitcoin and, and some of the uh, technologies, a good example being uh, you know, uh, flare uh, gas capture and the ability to actually mine on site. If you look at uh, anywhere where there is energy production, if you can monetize it on site versus having to move it, there's a, a ton of economic efficiencies and the ability to um, also have an environmental impact and, and kind of change the way that uh, the world operates is, is pretty positive. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of things outside. You know, we, we recently launched uh, something called Resi Club um, with uh, uh, probably the number one residential real estate journalist in the country, uh, Lance Lampert, uh, who had left fortune to do this. And people say, well, what are you guys doing in real estate? Housing affordability is the worst it's been in this century, 
right? And so when you look at it from a housing affordability standpoint, well, first you got to tell people, hey, it's unaffordable, or right? you got you got to kind of acknowledge the problem and, and really, really deeply understand what that problem is. So Linus does a great job of doing that. And then you look at the unique data and insights and analytics that we've got there, right? And the ability to continue to build a business that pulls as many eyeballs as possible to realize, hey, there is a problem here. We have to address this problem. Yep. And then it, you earn the right over time to go and potentially try to create more solutions and, and do stuff. But first is awareness. And so when you look at that, like that has nothing to do, for example, with Bitcoin on its face. Uh, but at the same time, I think it has everything to do with Bitcoin, right? In the sense of, well, actually, the, one of the reasons why the housing is unaffordable is because the dollar continues to be devalued. People aren't getting paid more. Their wages aren't going up. Productivity is going up. Um, you know, all these issues that Bitcoiners talk about. And so one of the problems is that housing has become unaffordable. And so you can want Bitcoin to be successful, and that is a way to protect your purchasing power of your quote unquote cash, right? And, and, and be able to do that. At the same time, if you have all of your money in Bitcoin, that doesn't buy you a house, yeah. right? And, and so how do you actually go and start to solve some of these problems? But really, I think one of the things Bitcoin did uh, incredibly well and continues to do incredibly well is there's a certain worldview that uh, people who hold Bitcoin tend to have. And that worldview is sometimes overlapping with others, many times not. And so if you take that worldview and you begin to look at these other markets, then you can start to understand, wait a second, I can use the knowledge and information and ethos from Bitcoin and apply to these other areas. Another example is if you read the book, uh, The Outsiders, it's basically about eight, uh, CEOs who outperformed uh, in their industries. And one of the things that you find in the book is these CEOs are excellent at doing two things. Mm -hmm. They basically have a decentralized structure and they push decision making down to the people who are closest to the problem. And they do a lot of sh uh, share buybacks. Well, why is that interesting? What does that have to do with Bitcoin? Bitcoin is decentralized. And so you can think about the decision making of the individual actors or closest to the problem. It's getting pushed down. Should we set up this Bitcoin mine? Should we not? What's the power source? All the stuff. Well, the local mine operator makes that decision, not some sort of headquarters and centralized operations. On share buybacks, well, that sounds a lot like lost Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? And Satoshi historically said, if somebody loses their Bitcoin, it's a contribution to the entire network. Well, same thing here is if a company's buying back their shares, right? It's a contribution back to all of the other equity holders. And so what you start to realize is this idea of Bitcoin and the structure and the ethos can be actually applied to all these other areas and yep. if done correctly can create solutions and so the way that i look at it is it is very clear that bitcoin is going to be successful it already is successful by many measurements uh, and the world is kind of waking up to this and every day more and more people are starting to understand that okay great um, if i was just an economic actor and that's the only thing that i cared about was how much money could i make then there's a very strong argument for i would go and i would put a ton of money into bitcoin and just leave it there and basically just chill right mm -hmm. um, sounds like michael Sandler. yeah that sounds yeah like, i mean yeah. there's for sure people doing it yeah. right um at the same time i think that there are a number of other problems right where we can use the things that we've learned in bitcoin and bring it to those other areas um and so uh it's harder to be completely honest right yeah um th there is a an ease that comes with just like <laughs> buy an asset and wait <laughs> yeah right um but doing those hard things can be uh, a worthwhile pursuit as long as you understand what the uh, intended outcome is and so um you know while i'm holding bitcoin and waiting there's a lot of other things that I've been spending time on and trying to say to myself, okay, how do I take the things that we learned here, which obviously work um, in, you know, and, and are in direct uh, uh, kind of difference than the status quo sure. and bring it to these other markets. And if we figure out even just one of them, it will have a profound impact. If we can figure out multiple ones of them, then that's something really special. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with all that. And I feel like that's also kind of where I'm spending my time building coinage, building trustless, the idea of community owned shows and media. I think everyone, Elon Musk included, talks about problems in the media. And I think, again, acknowledge the problem being step number one. I think a lot of people would say, sure, we have a media problem in this country. The incentives are misaligned. You get people either publishing fake news or you get people publishing content that pushes people farther into the fringes of society and no one can agree on anything. So to your point, consensus being a huge thing is what can we do as you know a media operation that kind of lets people agree on fact. And then if we tell enough facts that are objectively true, also allows our viewers to enjoy in the value accrual of doing so. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think there's just a lot of different things that, yes, when you take the Bitcoin model and apply it to, you know, whatever sector it may be, I'm excited to see what happens when, you know, you have people building with their communities together and unlocking some of those benefits. So that's kind of what we're doing here. I know that we, we budgeted just enough to get people interested in what we had to say today. And then hopefully they come back for other other times. And, and thank you again for coming out here, man. I mean, of I know course. it's not close. Yeah, I know we're kind awesome of tucked space. away here in Brooklyn, but thank you for coming down here. It's very cool. Hope everyone uh, continues to watch, subscribe, like, uh, smash follow. that like button. Yeah, w w whatever, whatever you need them to do, go do it, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I know. I appreciate it. We'll wrap there. Pomp, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for listening again to another uh, Coinage chat here with Anthony Pompliano. That'll do it for us here on Coinage. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs>